Okay, we're ready. Okay, so as you know, have you seen from the syllabus, uh, a lot of the topics that we'll be doing, especially in the first half, it's kind of going over the sections you would have done in algebra already. So we will be going over a lot of stuff, a lot of things will be familiar. However, as it turns out, people usually don't know things as well as they think they do. So I still would like you to pay attention, and you're just really trying to perfect the skills that you've developed in algebra so far, uh, because they're going to be important later. So going over a lot of things, but try not to be bored. <laughs> try to pay attention and um, try to become even better than you used to be. So we're going to start with, from the beginning, 1.1, the real numbers. So you need to start out with a bunch of definitions here. So you want to build up the real numbers. Um, there are some more basic numbers that you should start with. Um, so there's what we call the natural numbers, or the counting numbers. The symbol for this is boldface n, written that way. Our definition for this set of numbers is going to be all the positive whole numbers. Going on forever. These are called the natural numbers. So if anyone talks about being a natural number, they're talking about being a positive integer. And the integers are just whole numbers. just definition. This set is the natural numbers. You also have what we call the integers. This is boldface z. Um, I forgot what the name for z was, um, but it's, it's from a German name for whole numbers, I think. Uh, and so they use z. And this is kind of like the, pot, the naturals with the negative naturals and zero. So this is all whole numbers, including the negatives, the positives, and zero. So several ways you can write this down, but you can start by saying oh, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. So that set of numbers is called the integers. Right? So these are the natural numbers, the negative natural numbers, and the number zero. Um, by the way, we can mention, depending on the source you're talking about, some sources include zero. In the natural numbers, and they take n to be 0, 1, 2, da da da, but not us. Um, just be aware that if you're reading different textbooks and you're looking up different sources, you might have a slightly different definition here. Um, so, those are the integers. We also have what we call the rational numbers. So what these guys are, these are the fractions. These are the guys that look like A divided by B, such that A and B, and I, I, I'll probably define um, these no, this notation that I'm using uh, pretty soon, in case you're being confused by it. So this is saying A and B are integers. These are just whole numbers, and I'm taking a division of them. Uh, and B is not zero, right? So this will have a lot of things in it. It will like have a half, minus three over seven, 29 over 31, etc. cetera. Right? All things that look like fractions where you're taking a ratio of whole numbers. These are called the rational numbers. And then finally we can come to the real numbers. Now these guys are very difficult to define. Before you can write down precisely what these guys are, you have to get to a really high level of math. But we can kind of describe it here. And the notation here is boldface r. 
these are called the real numbers. Several ways you can think about it. It's very difficult to actually write down this kind of notation, what this set looks like. Um, but you can think of it as all decimal expansions or all numbers on the number line. <coughs> It's Q with the gaps on the number line filled in. So it turns out that if you look at a number line and you start to plot all these fractions on it, and you start to say, okay, here's your zero, here's your one, here's your one half, Here's your quarter, here's your da da da. You'll actually miss gaps in them, right? So if you try to plot all the fractions on the number line, you'll miss a lot of spots. Now, if you go in and you fill in all those spots, you'll end up with the real numbers. So, for example, um, if there would be a spot between 1 and 2 where there is no fraction that can fit there, and but there's a number called the radical 2 that is going to fit there, that will be. 1.4 da da da. It's a non repeating decimal. You cannot write it as a fraction. It's a gap as far as the rational numbers are concerned. But the real numbers is just taking all the rational numbers and filling in all the gaps. These numbers that are not rational but they're on the number line, these are called the irrational numbers. You can describe that as it's the set R minus the set Q. So if you take all the numbers on the number line except these, you get those guys. So these guys, you will have things like radical 2, you'll have pi, you have e, you have 1 over 2 pi squared, etc. You have all the numbers that you cannot write as fractions, but they're still on the number line. They represent a spot on the number line. So these are called the irrational numbers. There's a set C, this is a set of complex numbers. These are guys of the form A plus IB, such that A and B are real numbers, and I is the imaginary unit, defined as the square root of negative 1, and we will not be using complex numbers in our class, so you kind of don't have to worry about them. If there is a situation where a complex number will be the answer to your, your question, you would just write no solution or no real solution. As far as we're concerned, these numbers don't exist at the moment. Um, once there's an I attached to it, so uh, you probably don't need to worry about it. But they're invented to solve very special problems. So those are the, the basic sets of numbers that we have. The real numbers are the one we really like. They're very nice. And they are the only numbers that completely fill in the number line. If you plot any of these sets on the number line, you'll miss a lot of gaps. Right? So the real numbers have no gaps. And it turns out that having no gaps between the numbers that you're counting is super important for calculus. So we need to learn about it in pre-calculus. So those are just some basic definitions. OK. Starting from the beginning here. What else do I want to tell you about? I don't think I need to say about that. Let's talk about properties of the real numbers. Right. So every time we introduce a new set, it's nice to know what rules they adhere to. The real numbers will uh, satisfy certain rules when it comes to mathematical operations like addition, subtraction, etc., etc., etc. So one property is the fact that how many symbols am I going to need here? Uh, let A, B, C uh, be real numbers. Then, one, it turns out that A plus B is going to be the same for us as B plus A. You can add two real numbers, and it's not going to matter what order you add them in. You can also multiply two real numbers, 
and it will not matter what order you multiply them in. These are called the commutative properties. So we can say addition and multiplication are commutative for the real numbers. When someone says that statement, they're basically saying the order in which you do these things does not matter. Right? You can say the real numbers commute when it, when it comes to addition and multiplication. Order does not matter. Another uh, property that you, is important to know is called the associative properties. Meaning, when you have three things being added together, you will get the same answer if you add the first two and then add the third versus if you add the second two and then add the first. This is also true for multiplication. If you're multiplying three things together, you can multiply the first two and then take that answer and multiply the third. Or you can multiply the second two, take that answer and multiply the first, and they will give you the same answer at the end. This is called the associative properties. So it's the property that says you can shift parentheses across addition and multiplication um, without consequence. There's also a very another very important property. It's called the distributive properties. So this is the property that says a times b plus c is equal to a times b plus a times c. And Again, a times c plus b times c. These are called the distributive properties. Basically, an axiom is a mathematical statement. Without proof. So these are just a list of statements that we literally accept on faith. Right? Now, that might be a very difficult concept for some people to imagine, that what math is based on faith. Well, yes, at the very basic level, it is. Turns out to prove something, you have to assume something. You can't look and things appear out of nowhere. At some point, you have to just say, let's pretend this is what reality is like, and let's build on top of that. And for us, the real numbers are built on these properties. These are things we'll assume work, and everything we derive from here on will ultimately have to obey all these properties at some level. So these are called axioms. So again, it's statements without proof, but at the same time, they should be very fundamental, very adhering to reality. So for example, the distributive law, for example, we believe this is true because our physical reality will kind of suggest it. So it turns out that if you look at this, there's a, a way you can interpret this, right? So we define area, for example, to be the length times width, right? They have a rectangle, length times width. Right? So let's say you have a rectangle. The width, this length here, is A. And let's slice this part in two. And if we take this part here is B, and that part here is C, that means the entire length is going to be B plus C. And physical reality that we find ourselves in just happens to work out this way, that if we take the area here, we can con consider it in two different ways. I can think of it as the length times the width of the big triangle, which is going to be A times B plus C. 
I can also think of the area, for example, as the sum of the areas of the two triangles, the sum of rectangle. The sum of rectangle 1 plus n2. I just say area of rectangle 1 plus area of rectangle 2. Right. So I think of this as rectangle 1, rectangle 2. So the area of this one, again, length times width, that will be a times b. The area of this rectangle will again be length times width, that's a times c. But obviously these both have to be the same thing. So it makes sense that a times b plus c should be equal to a b plus a c. Therefore, we accept this as a fact. Something that's physical reality, we don't know why it's true, it's just very obvious to us that it is true. So these are properties that the real numbers obey, and we accept them on faith. Right? There is no, there's nothing before this. This is in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, when it comes to mathematics. This is where it all starts. These are the properties of real numbers. Which means they should not be violated. Everything you do in this class from here on must ultimately obey these rules if you're dealing with real numbers. Right, so that's the important thing. Okay, what else do I want to tell you about? Oh, uh, I also want to mention some terminology that we'll be using here. When you look at this expression, these things are considered equal, which means you can go from the left side to the right side, or you can go from the right side to the left side, and they're always considered the same thing. The processes have names, though. If you go from a situation like this to a situation like that, we call that expanding. Right? Or expanding the brackets, or expanding the parentheses. You go from a situation like this where there are no parentheses to a situation like this where they are parentheses, we call that factor. So the process of moving from this situation to that situation is expanding. Moving from this situation to that situation, we call it factoring. Uh, factoring we will cover in some detail later on. Um, factoring is a very important skill to know because it allows us to simplify a lot of things and figure out to solve a lot of problems. Um, a lot of equations that we want to solve, for example, we need to factor things in order to solve them. So we, we will visit that at some point, but now I just want you to know what it's called. Now, we can talk about things like addition and subtraction. identity. For the real numbers. Since if you add it to someone, it gives you the identity of that thing. So if I take 0 plus anything, the result is just the identity of the thing that I added to 0. We also have something called the existence of negatives. such that if I take a and I add it to minus a, it gives me the additive identity. 
minus a is called the negative of a. Or sometimes it just might say negative a. something called, uh, so addition, is a move by units to the right on the number line. So I can talk about what does it mean to say 2 plus 3, well that means, for example, I can start at position two, and I move to the right by three units. So I'll move one unit, two plus one, two units, two plus two, three <coughs> units, two plus three, and by organizing these units according to the natural numbers, it turns out that this number will end up being at position five. Therefore, we can say that two plus three equals five. Because if I start at two, move three units to the right, I will end up in position 5. Subtraction is a move to the left. This reverses, or it's the opposite of addition. It's a move to the left. by whatever units you're working with. So again, I can start at position two, and I can talk about what does it mean when I say two minus three? Well, it means I start at position two, and I move three units going that way. So I look at my list of the integers that go in order, and I count that way three ways. So that would be one, zero, minus one. So I can say two minus three is minus one. can consider a minus b to be a plus the negative of b. These will be equivalent. Also, I want you to note minus a does not have to be negative, so be careful. Right? For example, If a is equal to minus 3, then minus a would be positive 3, so this is a positive number. That would be a negative number. So, of course, you should know the negative numbers, these are the guys on the left of zero on number line. Positive numbers are the guys who are on the right of zero on number line. Zero itself is neither positive nor negative. Zero is called a non-negative number. It includes the, the positive but also not negatives. Zero is a non-negative. You can also call it non-positive, but it's usually described as a non-negative. It does not fall into either category. Zero is uh, special. Zero is very special. It took mankind thousands of years to come with the idea of zero. I know to us it seems simple, but yeah, li literally what I just did on the board was like a few hundred years of human evolution. Okay, let's uh, continue. Some of you are rolling your eyes, I'm so bored, and, and it's like, 
people struggled for centuries to come up with this stuff. <laughs> okay, let's continue. Um, we should get to some interesting stuff today, um, but we have to start off We're from the beginning with our definitions. Um, some of them are so obvious that you kind of internalize them, so I have to remind myself which ones I have to remind you about. Um, the negative numbers also have properties, or the negative sign, uh, properties of negatives. So, some ones that, these are not axioms, by the way. Meaning these can be proven. You can actually mathematically derive and justify why the following have to be true. Um, but in the meantime, you can just accept them on faith. We're not going to prove them. If you're interested in knowing what the proof is, there's a class called Advanced Calculus, which you can take after Calculus 3, and you will prove these. You guys often have the adage, oh, a negative times negative is a positive, right? That's not something that's natural, right? That's not something that you can actually see in reality and I can point to a rectangle for which that's true. That's something you have to figure out mathematically. that the negative of a number is equidistant from zero on the other side. So if over here I have A, then negative A will be here, and there will be the same distance from zero. We'll talk about absolute values and get back to this as well. So this here, distance 2, and this here, distance 1, the distances are the same. So pictorially, that's how you can think of negatives. They're just on the opposite side of zero on the number line, equidistant away from zero. I don't think I have to do any examples for addition. Um, but we're going to talk about multiplication and the multiplication of fractions. And then we have to do examples for that, because students usually suck at fractions. So I'll give you some examples there. Um, but for now, I'm just telling you these properties that I expect you to know. identity. So the number 1 is called the multiplicative identity of the real numbers. Since with multiplication, multiplying this guy by anyone gives the identity of the guy. So 0 is the additive identity, because if you add 0 to anything, you just get the identity of the thing. 1 is the multiplicative identity, because if you, add, if you multiply 1 by anything, you just get the identity of the thing. If a is not 0, then 1 over a is a real number called the reciprocal of a, or they might say inverse, but they'll probably for emphasis, I'll say multiplicative inverse of A. So this is 1 divided by A.
And you should also note, if you take A times its multiplicative inverse, you will get the multiplicative identity. Again, that's something you'd have to prove, but we're not going to prove it. We're not just now. Uh, so, by the way, this dot here, if it's a dot on the center of the line, it's not on the base, it's towards the center, it just means multiplication. of division as the opposite of multiplication. It undoes multiplication. We'll talk about that a little more when we start talking about um, solving equations. And we define A divided by B as A times the reciprocal of B, which we can write as A divided by Remember something I want to tell you guys here, but I'll probably save that for a little bit later. This I want to tell you also how to add fractions, how to multiply fractions, how to divide fractions. Um, what else do I want to tell you? Yeah, multiply, divide, add, cancellation law, cross multiply. Okay. We can multiply fractions by doing the following. If I have a fraction A over B, <coughs> multiplying by C over D. You can also talk about um, adding fractions, A over, let's say I have A over C plus B over C versus A over B plus C over D. Together now, what is this one? AC B. AC over BD. You just multiply the top, multiply the bottom. That is how you multiply a fraction. A plus B over C. Come again? A plus B over C. 
A plus B over all over C. C. This one? Multiply. D. A D plus B C over B D. That one seem, might be a little strange. But the idea is you create a common denominator. So you would multiply this by D over D. You'd multiply this by B over B. The denominators, according to this multiplication, will give you B, D in both denominators. Mm -hmm. Then use rule 2 to add those, and you'll get this. How do you divide fractions? Flip, 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 flip. Right, so there's a thing, keep, change, flip. Right? So you keep this one, change this to multiplication, flip, flip that one. Uh, so it's called, you just, uh, to divide one fraction by another, you <coughs> multiply by the reciprocal of the second fraction. What happens here? Cancel that. Right, you can cancel the C, a and this B. will give you A over B. This is this is called the cancellation law. So you can say we can cancel C. Right, might be how I I refer to that fraction. This if this fraction equals that fraction then the cross multiplication might, will be, this statement must be true, and this is called, referred to as cross multiplication. Now, again, it might not be obvious here because these two fractions can look different, but for example, we can talk about, for example, a half versus three over six, right? How would I know a half is equal to 3 over 6, because if I take this times this, I would get 6, and 2 times 3 also gives me 6, so bing, right? So I have two fractions that I don't know. Are they the same? Is one bigger than the other? Blah, blah, blah. If they're equal, this statement will be true. If they're not equal, this statement will not be true. So for example, if you had to solve an equation where it's like 1 over x equals 0, you should immediately know that has no solution. Because the numerator is 1. 1 will never be equal to 0, therefore this fraction will never be equal to 0. Very simple case in which knowing that can come up. Every now and then you'll see an equation where you have to solve for something, maybe set it equal to 0, you should be aware. You need, if you want a fraction to be zero, you need to set the top equal to zero. The denominator is irrelevant when it comes to solving for that fraction to be zero. Okay. Now, let's move on. Let's talk about something called the least common denominator. This is, um, this is the smallest positive whole number at a set that the denominators A 
subset of fractions. All divide into evenly. That means by evenly, I mean when the result is a whole number. When you divide them. How do you find the LCD? Finding the LCD is going to be important. Can anyone describe to me how to find the LCD of two numbers? Two or more. Right. So say I have two fractions. Uh, I wrote down some. I said 3 over 16 and 5 over 12. What is the LCD? That's the GC. Huh? 36? Is that a guess? Let's say you didn't know it was 36 because you weren't so familiar. How would you actually go about finding it? Yeah? No. Just if you multiply these, you get way more than 36, and we know 36 is the answer. Yeah? Divide like 16, 4 by 4, and then 4, 2, and 2. Okay, what he's describing is the prime, is called the prime factorization. One, find the prime factorization of the numbers. This means you're going to factor the numbers into a bunch of prime numbers. Do you all remember what the prime numbers are? These are the numbers that the only divisors are themselves and one. Right, so numbers larger than 1, where the only thing that can divide into it and not create a fraction that's not a whole number is itself or 1. So 2, 3, 5, 7, not 9, because 9 can be divided by 3 and you get a whole number answer. 11 would be the next one, etc. These are called prime numbers. You want to factor, and remember what factor means, you want to write this as a representation with parentheses with a bunch of things in parentheses. Okay, so find the prime factorization is the first thing. Then the LCD is... The product of all primes that appear raised to their largest powers. If you raise it to the smallest powers, that gives you the GC. But if you raise it to the largest powers, that gives you the LC. So for example, here, you realize 16, you try to start to break that down. You realize that 2 can go into 16, that's 2 times 8. Right? Then you realize 2 can go into that, that's 2 times 4. Right? But 4 you also know is 2 times 2. So in other words, this guy I can think of as 2 to the 4. This is called the prime factorization of 16. I would do the same thing for 12. It's even. 2 is the smallest prime number, so I'm going to divide into that. Well, this is 2 times 6. Then I realize this is 2 times 2 times 3. In other words, I can think of this as 2 squared times 3. So now all the prime numbers that show up are 2 and 3. So this means the LCD is going to be 2 times 3, but I have to put the largest power. Now 2 shows up, and what is the largest power? to the fourth four. is the largest power. Three shows up in one position, so the largest power is obviously this power. That's going to be one. So these are the largest powers. 16. 16. So now what we end up with is what? So two to the four? 16. 16. 16 times three? 16 times three? 48. 48. 48 is the LCD of these two numbers. This is the smallest number that both of them can divide into. And you will also know 
that if you just multiplied 16 and 12, you would get something a lot bigger than 48. So this is called the LCD. Now let's talk about adding these two fractions. So let's say I had 3 over 16 and I wanted to add to it 5 over 12. There are a couple ways you can do this. I'm going to talk about one way here, but there are a couple ways you can do this. So the idea of what we want to do here, how you do this. So let me first do it. Uh, by the definition. And I'm going to contrast that with us using the LCD so you can see the difference of why one may be preferable to the other. So by the definition, what would the answer be? All right, this means on the list of properties that I had over there, how would you actually add these two? Well, you multiply the 12 by the 3, then you multiply the 16 by the 5, Then you'd multiply the 16 by the 12. Now what's that going to be? What's 3 times 12? 36. Huh? 36. 36. What's 5 times 16? 80. Huh? 80. Uh, that's 80. Uh, what's 16 times 12? What? 192. One what? 192. 192. Okay. Now, start adding these up. What is this? One, 116? 116 over 192. <coughs> now, that's your answer, but let's say I wanted to reduce this. Like, what would I have to do now? Huh? Yeah, how would I do Go to the lowest. Check. Huh? Go to the lowest. Yeah, but how? Yeah, well, I Huh? How do you get to the lower one? Yes. You could start with missing by two. Sure. So two into this goes how many times? Come again? 58. Right. Two into one you can't. Two into eleven <laughs> goes five times remainder of one. 2 into 16 goes 8 times. Okay. What about this one? 86. Hmm? 86. Yeah, so 2 into 19 goes what? 86. I can't oh. hear you. 96. 86? No, 96. Then you'd reduce again. 2 into this goes what? And remainder 18, that's 29. Two into this. 48. 48. Can we reduce those? No. Okay. So that's going to be your answer. Now, let's compare that to us using the LCD to help us get the fraction. There's a reason why I wanted you guys to suffer through that. There's I'm not someone who just likes to make people feel pain. There's a reason. I want you to remember the feeling of doing things one way versus another way. So when you're in a test and I tell you, you have five minutes left and you need to get through this problem the quickest way, you'll have a, a bunch of memories in your head when Javon made you struggle through this. And then you'll see Javon made you do something else and hey, you know what, I'm gonna do it this way. Okay, so now let's use the LCD. How would you, use the LCD to add these guys. Yeah. Multiply um, 3 over 16 by 3, and then 5 over 4 by 4 to get like 40 numbers. Right. So you are going to multiply and divide by whatever number is going to give you the LCD, which now we know is 48. Right? Now, in the event that you had to do this and factor it, 
right? So you know the, the LCD is going to be uh, 2 to the 4 times 3. You can see here that the thing missing from the 16 is the 3. So you can just put that in, multiply by 3. But of course, you have to multiply and divide by 3, so you're multiplying by 1, so you're not changing anything. Similarly, this is 2 to the square times 3. What's missing here is a 2 squared, right? So in other words, that's 4. So I multiply and divide by 4. Now, once you do that right away, right? And this is even an intermediate step. You can do this if you want. Maybe I'll write it in red. You can be like, OK, so this is going to be 9 over 48. This is going to be 20 over 48. And rule two of our list of rules says what? The denominators are the same, you just add the top, 29 over 48. Felt a lot easier, right? So this is the benefit of knowing how to find an LCD. And um, especially in the cases where we would want to use it, it's even going to be easier to find than here. But not knowing the LCD can uh, cause you a lot of um, needless pain. Let's look at some other situations where the LCD can come in handy. I believe I put some examples here. And this one was actually on the first quiz, so let's see if uh, the use of the LCD. Other ways to use, other ways. Example. On the first quiz, I asked you to simplify this expression. y over x minus x over y over 1 over y minus 1 over x. <coughs> so this was us adding fractions uh, by definition, and this was by LCD. And again, I'm going to do this two ways, um, so you can compare the ways. Now, some of you might have done it this way, but um, it's the less efficient way to do it. Here is one way. Combining fractions in numerator and denominator first. So what you can do is you can apply your rules and just focus on the numerator and the denominator first. So you can say, okay, how would I add these two fractions? Okay, so we just learned our lesson. We're definitely going to want to use the LCD. So by that same principle, sure, I don't know what X and Y are, so my best guess here for the LCD would be the product of the two. Why? These are two things that show up. The highest power I see them showing up in two is one. So um, here I would say the LCD is XY. Now you can use it in this way, first figuring out the numerator and denominator. So you can go and you can say, okay, Y over X minus X over Y all over one over Y minus one over X. And you can decide to say, OK, I'm going to multiply this by y over y. I'm going to multiply that by x over x. I'm going to multiply this by x over x. I'm going to multiply this by y over y. You can then combine these functions. What would I have on the top? I'd have y squared over xy minus x squared over xy over x over xy minus y over xy. So this is basically y squared minus x squared over xy over x minus y over xy, right? So that, that would be where you get, right? Now how do you actually divide these two fractions? Well, you keep change flip. So I'll keep the top one. Change that to a multiplication and flip the bottom one. The 
these would cancel. Now I remember what I wanted to tell you guys. <laughs> uh, let's hope I remember later on. But the, what I want to tell you guys is that technically things, when you're multiplying fractions, you can shift things the order because multiplication is commutative. As long as things in the top stay in the top, things in the bottom stay in the bottom, it doesn't matter what order you write them in. So I can literally shift this x, y off, shift this x, y off, and cancel them over here. But we just show it by me doing that. So ultimately, but knowing in your head that you can kind of shift things as long as they stay in the numerator or denominator is a very important thing that can come up. So you eventually get here. Now what can you do? Difference of squares. We looked at that on the first day. Then, multiply. Multiply. Careful. Oh, of course. just cancel right away. What's the what's the problem here? Multiply. Multiply. These are turned, right? Here's y minus x. Here's x minus y. Technically, they're not the same thing. You could factor out a negative one, make this negative and that positive, and now you can cancel. And so minus x plus y was the answer. I don't know if you remember what you did, but that was the answer for that. Okay. Now, let's look at another way to use the LCD. So that was one option. method is to just do the following. Multiply and divide by LCD. And I mean multiply and divide the entire complex fraction. A complex fraction is just a fraction that has fractions in its numerator and denominator. Okay? So given that this, I have this guy happening, over y over 1 over y minus 1 over x. Here was the other alternative. Knowing that the LCD is xy, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply and divide by the LCD, multiply the entire thing. Now, distributive law takes effect. I'm going to have the xy times this and the xy times that. <coughs> Right? And then I'm going to have the xy times this and the xy times that. Okay. Now at first this looks probably a little bit more complicated, but it, it simplifies itself uh, quickly. Because right? if you take x times y and multiply this, what's going to happen? So y is going to cancel? The x's will cancel. Right? The x in this denominator is going to cancel that x. So you'll immediately get y times y. y squared. So you immediately get y squared here. Similar to here, x, y times this, the y's would cancel. I'll just left with x times x, so I immediately get minus x squared here. Over this times this, the y's are going to cancel. And I'll just have x here. This times this, the x's are going to cancel. And I'll just be left with the y here. So you can see, I skipped one, two, three, four steps by multiplying and dividing by the LCD. Right? This isn't wrong, it's just not very efficient. This, using the LCD in this way to simplify a complex fraction is far more efficient. Yes? I would argue that I learned that through like just grit and like, you know, just going through it. So yeah. doing that in my head is faster than actually trying to learn that. Help me out. Uh, it's your prerogative, I guess. In some sense, I'm, I'm never really going to force you to do one way over the other. I can tell you these are your options and pick the one you like more. Um, so now this one, yeah, pr pretty much now I, I just go here. So this is y minus x, x plus y, or x minus y. This cancels into that negative one times and you get minus x plus y.
to stay here, let's do another example maybe. Maybe I can win you over to trying this method. Do you like the other one? Here's another example. Let's say my f of x is 1 over x squared. Find the difference for me. Let's begin. What does f of x plus h look like? necessarily in this case. So this gives you a complex fraction. At this point, you have a couple ways to start simplifying this. One way, you can combine the fractions of the numerator and denominator separately, keep the change flip. It would be longer than just multiplying and dividing by that right away. Doing that, this times this, these guys cancel, I'm left with an x squared. This times this, the x squared cancel, I'm left with this. Denominator becomes h x squared times x plus h squared. If you prefer the first method I showed you, you can try to do it here. If you get here, no problems. Uh, I, I have no complaints. How would we finish up here? Remember that h is what we want to cancel. So what can we do? Factor what? What would you do at this point? Right. Expand the numerator. can make right here, because some people might be tempted to do it, never expand the denominator. Denominator should always be in a factored form because you want to end up knowing how to cancel things if it's possible to cancel. Um, the numerator you might want to expand uh, to rewrite things, but it's never a good idea to expand the, the denominator. You're just going to get yourself in trouble. So now that we know that, here we see that the x square and the x square will cancel. Moving over here. by factoring out that h. So now you have what? Minus 2x minus h over x squared times x plus h squared. And that's uh, pretty much the simplest way you can have it. Another example, let's see. find the common denominator, add all the fractions in the numerator, add all the fractions in the denominator, keep change flip. 
or multiply and divide by the LCD. What's the LCD here? A squared. A squared is the LCD. Multiply and divide by A squared. That's going to multiply that, 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 this, this, this. All of it. 2 times A squared. 5 times 5. 5A, because the A's cancel. Minus 3. 2 times A squared. 5A plus 2. How do you simplify that? You want a factor? Which we'll, we'll probably go over this again. I'm pretty sure there's a factoring section in our syllabus. But I'm pretty sure these factor here. So for this, you can have the AC method, or you can do the trial and error method. Um, we'll probably go over both soon. But I'm just going to do trial and error here because if you if you practice it, you'll, you'll tend to get quicker. Um, so 2a and a are the only options here. There's only one way to get a 2 by multiplying integers, 2 and 1, right? 2 times 1. So I put 2a here, a here. 2a here, 1a there, right? Now, I want to put the numbers here so that they will multiply and give me minus 3, right? Now, I have two options. I can put the 3 here and the 1 here because that's the only way to get a 3. Or I can put the 1 here and the 3 here. Right? So this is where the trial and error comes. You're, you're thinking about all the situations in your head. The thing that helps you decide is that you have to remember that the middle term will be the sum of the products of the outer terms and the inner terms. Right? So if I put the, so th this is actually the right way. Let's pretend we did the wrong way first. <laughs> so let's say I put a 3 here and a 1 here. Oh, maybe that's good. Okay, what would I get here? That would give me a 2a, and this would give me a 3a, right? Can I do that and get a subtraction and add up to 5a? Can I get a positive 5 while getting a subtraction? Right, no, because if I make this a minus or that a minus, it won't add up to 5, right? So then you, you would just this here and this here. Now we have 6a and 1a. Can I use 6a and 1a with a subtraction, because I know I have to have a minus sign, in order to get 5? Yes. yes. If I take a positive 6 minus 1, I would get a 5. So I know I should put a plus here and a minus here. Yes? So what happens if you put the plus 3 with the 2a instead? Because it won't, if, let's say you made a mistake and you put a plus 3 here, and a minus 1 here, this will give you 3a, this will give you minus 2a. If you add those, you don't get 5. So after you throw in the numbers, you can quickly check mentally if you're right, or go back. Okay. Similarly here, this is a 2, the only options are 2 and 1. I can put, say, a 1 here and a 2 here. This will give me 4 and 1. I want to get a 5, I need to subtract both of them. Minus 4, minus 1 gives me the minus 5. <coughs> That's your factor. Okay. Now, yes, the AC method is another option. We'll talk about that at some point later. But if you get really good at manipulating the numbers in your head like this, you'll be a lot quicker with this than the AC method. Um, now, what do you notice? Those end up being the same. And we would have a plus 3. So yes, the, we have to both know how to do things, but also know the most efficient way, because remember, calculators aren't allowed. You have to be really good at um, mentally manipulating numbers and expressions. And so when it comes to that, being efficient is um, very important. You can know a way to do a problem, but if you do the longer way, and you have to solve one problem to plug into another problem, you'll end up spinning. The, the time you're taking in computation just builds and builds and builds, and 
taking more steps gives you more options to make mistakes. So you, you, you would want to learn the more efficient way. Even if it will take you some time to learn a new way, if it cuts out four steps, it's worth it in the long run. Right? Think of all those four steps you're saving on every problem during a whole semester, on all the homework, all the quizzes, all the tests. You're saving four steps each time. It's a lot of work that you're saving. Yeah? I didn't mean I would follow the long route for every circumstance, only that in practicing the rhythm around yeah, yeah. and take it, apply it. And yeah. I wasn't it. talking to you. I'm talking, I'm making a general statement. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. No. So uh, a lot of times I'll, I'm, I'm just making general statements because I want you to know, again, individually you might be different, right? You might prefer a way so much that you're so much faster at it. That's you, that's, and that's fine. I, I'm not gonna mark you incorrect because you don't do something the way I do it. But <clears throat> statistically speaking, in my experience, the longer students take to work through a problem, the more mistakes they make, statistically speaking. One or two individuals might be different, but on a whole, on average, efficiency is going to be better. And it's up to you to know which way is better for you in practice. That's what your homework is for. When you're practicing a bunch of homework problems, you're going to learn. You're going to try some things my way, try some things your way, see which ones you can do quicker and get more accurate results, and just go with that way. And forget the other way. Okay. Uh, how much time do we have? 20 minutes. Uh, a few more definitions. Um, we kind of use these already, but uh, let's actually make it uh, define these for sure. How about sets? Definition. A set is a an unordered. Collection of objects. That's pretty much it. Notation. Uh, first thing, we can name sets. Example, we named some sets at the beginning of this course like R, N, Q. But we can also just name a random set, like call it uppercase A. Right, we usually use uppercase letters, but not always. So instead of just a collection of objects, we can name them just like we can name functions. We can name sets. Another thing to do with notation is that there are Two main notations that you should know about uh, sets. You don't have to know the names, but I'll tell you about the names. One is called the roster method. This means you list the elements of the set in these brackets. And by elements, I mean the objects that make up the collection. These might be called the elements or members of the set. So for example, I can say A equals the set of positive single digit. even numbers. And so this means that I can express A to be 2, 4, 6, 8. And whenever you express the set like that, this is called the roster method. You can use ellipses. writing if pattern is obvious. 
So for example, when I was telling you about the natural numbers, I couldn't write down every single one, even if I wanted to. So I just went one, two, three, four. As soon as I feel like I've written down enough for you to get the pattern, you know what's going to come next. Dot, dot, dot. I put dot, dot, dot. Right? There's an infinite number of things, I can't write them all down. But even if, with a finite number of things, if I had a set with a thousand things in it, I'm not going to write down a thousand things on the paper. Write down the first few in a way so that you can get the pattern. Then I'm going to put dot, 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 comma, put the last one. So I can say also something like, E equals uh, first 1,000 positive integers. So this means I can say B is 1, 2, 3, I think they get it, dot, 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 stop at 1,000. So you can write the sets that way. This is called the roster method. Another way is called the set builder method. This means you don't list, but you describe a property that the things in your set will have. Right? I use the set builder method when I defined the set Q for you earlier. So this means I can say A equals for example, this A here, and I can just say it's the set of all things X such that X is even, positive, and uh, single digit. So sometimes you can't think of a way to write something down so that the pattern becomes obvious to whoever is reading it. Uh, and so what you do is you can write this notation. This bar here is, uh, it's, it represents, it's called such that, right? So this is the, um, a generic member. You might give it a variable name, and this is the property, the must, property members must satisfy. Right? So you might remember when I wrote Q, I couldn't just write out a bunch of fractions. You're not going to know how to write them all down, right? So what I said is, it looks like A divided by B, and I tell you what the properties are. A and B have to be integers, and B cannot be zero. So you can build up a set that way. Via a description within the roster method, you can list everyone, and so on and so forth. Now, if someone is in a set, you might use the symbol a member of, That symbol means a member of. And this symbol with a strike through it means not a member of. A lot of things in math are like that, by the way. If you have a symbol that means something, to say not that, a lot of times the, the symbol for that just puts a strike through the other thing. So for example, I can say one is a member of n but minus 3 is not a member of n. So this is saying the number 1 is in that set, but the number minus 3 is not in that set. And so that's why I could say with Q, I use the uh, set builder notation. And I wrote this down. So now you can know what I mean. It's objects that look like this, one thing divided by another. These things belong to the set of integers, and the one on the bottom is not the zero integer. <coughs> so I just told you how to create these members and what properties they must satisfy, but I can't really write down a description in a way that you can understand it beyond this. It's hard to find a pattern by which to write out the front. Not super hard, but harder than you'd want to have to do. Union and intersection sets. Uh, 
Uh, let's talk about union. This symbol here, this is the set of all x such that x is in A or x is in B. Possibly both. And we call this the union of A and B. So you pretty much list all the elements that show up in either one. An example. You can say something like uh, Z is the union of N with the negatives of N with the set zero. Or you can say, to give you a simpler example, create two stupid sets and co combine them. Uh, like for example, I can say A is the set one, two, three, B is the set two, seven, nine. Then I can say A union B is going to be write enough, all the elements that show up in either or. So there are the things that show up in A, this shows up in A, this shows up in A, this shows up in B, but I already wrote it down, this shows up in B, this shows up in B. So that is called the union. The set of things that show up in either or set. Possibly both, in this case, uh, two showed up in both. By the way, the elements that show up in both a lot of times it's important for us to know what these guys are as well. And when you try to find those guys, you say you're finding the intersection. Right, let me give you some more terminology here. The union of A and B, you can read it A union B. It's also read A or B a lot. It's an inclusive or. Another alternative, the intersection. for that is this symbol. To describe what it is, it's the set of all things such that x is in A and at the same time x is in B. This is called the intersection of A and B. You might also refer to it as A intersect B. refer to it as A and B. Example. In the above, this guy, A intersect B is what? Two. Two. The thing that shows up in both. Um, there's the notion of an empty set. This is the set with no elements. The notation is the following. That is called the empty set. This is a set with no elements. It's essentially an empty collection. Pretty much like an empty bag. A bag with no stuff in it. Now you might say, why would we care about a bag with no stuff in it? Well, I mean, walking around with an empty bag for it, we're not carrying anything, what's the point? Well, it, it shows you certain situations that are happening. So sometimes you might be looking for a situation, but you end up realizing that that situation can never actually be fulfilled, and the empty set could be a way of representing that phenomenon. So for example, I can say A is equal to the set 1, 2, 3, and I can say B is the set A, B, C, and someone can ask, what is A intersect B? Here are these two sets of objects. Tell me who is in both of them at the same time, and the answer would be, there's nothing that's in both of them at the same time. Right? This is an option. You want to have the ability to say, there are no things that fulfill this property, and you say that by using the empty set.
intervals and interval notation. Yeah, we're, we're really starting from scratch here. But basically what this means is that none of you have any excuses anymore. <laughs> you can't be like, man, it's been like two years since high school since I added fractions, man. No, no we did this in lecture two. I told you what a set is in lecture two. We spoke about adding fractions, all this stuff. There's nothing you can tell me that you forgot or it's been a long time since you did it. We're starting from the very beginning. Uh, interval notation. Something that's going to be very important for us. So for this, you kind of need to know about equality, inequalities. Um, so you should know that that symbol means A is greater than B, right? Larger than mag in magnitude than B. Another way of saying that is that if I were to plot these guys on the number line, A is going to be to the right side. Um, this means A is greater than or equal to. It means it's potentially, they are potentially the same things. I may or may not know, but the potential is there, and I can just put a little slash under, and that means greater than or equal to. Of course, the reverse can happen. You can read this that A is less than B versus A is less than or equal to. Right. So that's what those notations mean. Sometimes we prefer to use other notation to represent these symbols, and they are defined via the following table. So this is the inequality notation. We can talk about also the interval notation. So here are some things we want to be able to say. Um, things like x is bigger than a x is bigger than or equal to a, x is smaller than a, x is smaller than or equal to a. Sometimes we want to describe x as being between two things. It's larger than a but smaller than b. Or it's larger than or equal to a but smaller than b. Or it's larger than a but less than b, potentially equal to b. Or it's potentially equal to a or b but it's in between them. All of these have a notation that corresponds to them, which we call interval notation, which a lot of time you'll be required to write your answer in this notation. And here we can just say x is in R, like a real number, or you can write x is between positive infinity and negative infinity. This notation here, you would write it in the following way. A is on the left, put the infinity sign, put parentheses. Whenever you can be equal to something, you don't use parentheses, you use brackets. The square bracket, A, infinity. This says we can be at A or anything larger going all the way up to infinity, but we cannot be equal to A. This says we can be A equal to it or anything larger going up to infinity. Uh, similarly here, A is the maximum but we can be equal to A versus A is the maximum but we are potentially equal to A. Here we write this as A comma B, sort of looks like a coordinate but within context you shouldn't have be confused. This would be <coughs> square back to A B, this would be A comma B, this would be bracket, bracket, and this would represent the minus infinity. So there are situations where you'd want to express these ideas, but you'd re be required to express them in interval notation, and that basically means this. Um, I don't know if this is going to really 
work out nicely here. But let's. We're going to be using this later, if not now, next time. There's also a pictorial way of doing this on the number line. Which I want you guys to be aware of. So this is the diagram. And they can be useful. So basically you're writing a number line in all of it. how you'd express this is you put the number A, you would open a circle on the number line, and you'd say, I can go anywhere bigger. For this one, you put the number A, you put a circle, but you'd shade it in and say, I can be anything bigger. This would say, you put the number A, here you put the number A, circle, I can be anything smaller. Here, shaded circle, I can be anything smaller. Here, you would put the numbers A and B, A and B, A and B, A and B. And in the first one, you'd represent it by an open circle, connected here. Here, you do a shaded circle, connected to an open circle. Here, you would do an open circle, connected to a shaded circle. Here, you would do two shaded circles. And here, this is the entire number line. So express it like that. Now, a lot of times you'll have intervals, which are just sets of things, but we want to find their intersections and unions. And we'll talk about how to actually do that next time with these pictures. And we'll do some examples of finding domains and things like that, where we'll actually use this notation. Um, so we'll stop there. Uh, we're not quite done with 1.1, so there's no homework on that yet, and we will definitely finish that next time and move on to 1.2. I'll see you guys in a moment.